Uh, she is here uh, helping us wrap up uh, John Meacham's uh, well, what what would we call it, John? Your your well, we'll just say uh, your 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 week here as a visiting professor uh, on Morning Joe. Um, Doris, I'll I'll let you ask John the first question. It is fascinating that we were just talking about the hinges uh, of history, uh, and and we saw there how history swung because of what Abraham Lincoln did. We just showed some deeply disturbing focus group. Uh, footage of people who still, to a person, Republicans still believe the election was stolen and January 6th was much ado about nothing. They're, they're, the, we, we, we are on the hinge of history right now as well, aren't we? Oh, without a question, Joe. I mean, I'd love to have John talk about this. I, I'm so glad that he's loving Lincoln like I have. I can now have my buddy to talk about Lincoln for the rest of my life. You know, when I first started studying Lincoln, um, I would met the dean of Lincoln scholars, David Donald, and he said to me, you will feel after spending time with him that you're a better person at the end for it. So that's the first question to John. Do you feel a sense that some of his qualities have, have come into you as a result of spending so much time with him? It's the best person in the world to spend time with. Oh, absolutely. And thank you. And I'm glad they're bringing in the big guns finally. Uh, so thanks. Thanks to, to Doris. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not a better person, uh, but I know what I should be. Um, and I think that my sense is, is that the, the virtual experience of studying Lincoln is it has made me want to be more broad gauged, to be more devoted to a consistent principle while still being empathetic, that is not becoming self-righteous. And I think that was probably the most remarkable thing about Abraham Lincoln, is he was principled but not self-righteous. And he knew that self-righteousness would be a problem, that the, the more he pounded on the table, the more he made the other side uh, feel that they were uh, lesser than, that that was not going to be part of bringing them back into the Democratic Covenant. However. He was absolutely devoted to the principle that slavery had to end and the union had to be preserved, not simply because the union was an innate good, but because it was this means to a more perfect, not just union, but a better way of living for all of us. He saw, he saw the Civil War as part of a global struggle, as part of a human struggle, because democracy makes all things possible. It's not perfect but it's better than all the alternatives. Uh, uh, John, um, this, is, this is from one of the little guns in this company, certainly. Uh, the, <laughs> you, you, and Dora, you and me, um, man. But, We're no but, little but, gun. Let, <laughs> but let me, let me ask first to John and then to Doris, uh, t just tell me something um, quickly about Lincoln that I either, uh, Lincoln the man, that I either don't know or don't fully appreciate. Very gentle. Uh, one thing that I think is very important, and this is critical, and Eugene, you're not wearing a tie, I see, so you'll appreciate this this morning. <laughs> he wore his, the tie he, the, the tie we see, the bow tie, was mm -hmm. what was called a stock, and it was a clip-on. It was tied in the back. Uh, and I always wondered uh, how he managed, there it is right there, how he managed to always sort of have it rakishly the same way. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is it's 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 not real. Uh, and our friend Harry Rubenstein <laughs> at, uh, at, uh, at the Smithsonian. So I so Smithsonian has all this, which is one of the marvelous things about the Smithsonian and about history is you can see what uh, what he'd actually touch. That's a black Brooks Brothers suit. Uh, Scarborough has a lot of those. And uh, so <laughs> it, it's, it's these t these t tiny things. Um, there's also. Uh, I think this is probably more, more to the point uh, on a serious note. When he goes to Ford's Theater on Good Friday, 1865, in his pocket, in his wallet, are a series of clippings. The, the Eugene Robinson of the era, if he had written a nice column about uh, Lincoln, he had clipped it. This is absolutely true. He had clipped it out and put it in his wallet. He had six or seven of them. And I love this idea that this man 
is trying to save the possibility of democracy. He's trying to liberate a people. He's trying to stand against an implacable, rebellious uh, force that was willing to put its own power ahead of everything else. In the middle of all that, he still needed at some level to know that people approved of what he was doing. Well, you know, John, when you think about going to Ford's Theater that night, I think one thing that I hadn't realized was that the reason he went that night was because he had to keep his word. He was having so much fun. The war had come to an end. He was finally able to relax at home. He didn't need to go to the theater as a diversion. And he said to his friends, I'd rather stay, but I have to go. And the reason he had to go was that he had promised the people that he would be there and he couldn't go back on his word. And that goes right back to what we saw at the very beginning. He had given his word that he would protect those federal forts. And so as a result, he had to do it. Otherwise, then he, he says at the beginning, and I'd love to have your thoughts on this, that democracy depends upon the fact that when you lose an election, as the South did, that you can't just go break up the union as a result of doing that. Right. Otherwise, democracy will be an absurdity. Does that ever sound like today? Oh, so 39 uh, percent vote for him in uh, November of 1860. And immediately, as your marvelous book and your, and your film show, there's a compromise on the table uh, to basically ex allow slavery to expand to parts of the Western territories. It's one of those eminently reasonable con compromises, seemingly reasonable, that um, America history is based on, right? His great hero, Henry Clay, would, would have been the architect of that kind of thing. And as you say, he said no. And Seward and all the respectables thought, you know, this is the thing to do. What is America if not an exercise in compromise? But he had won the election on anti-slavery principles. And as you say, he said, if we win an election and then immediately surrender the central claim of why we won the election, then it, the, the, it, it does not fulfill the democratic lowercase d enterprise. And I think it's one of the singular moments in the history of the West. It's like Churchill in 1940. It's this. It's like FDR trying to get us prepared, uh, despite the isolationism. It's this moment where Lincoln knew, and this is resonant as well for what we're dealing with at this very hour in the uh, in what Joe and everybody's been talking about. He knew that you could not appease the slave interest. You could not appease some uh, an interest that was not interested in the give and take of democracy. And he said, as you know, Doris, that if we give them functionally Arizona and New Mexico, which even Massachusetts Republicans were kind of for, it's like, okay, well, let, let them have that. He knew that that was simply the beginning and not the end. We know where the uh, border of the United States is, but they didn't. So slavery could have expanded to Cuba, it, it had, they, they tried it, filibusters had tried it in Nicaragua, parts of Mexico. Remember, the South's vision, the white South's vision of what the second part of the 19th century into the 20th century was going to be, was not this limited area of, of slave territory, but an entire empire. It was called by some the Golden Circle. And Cuba was going to be the center of, a, of an empire which with a capital in Richmond, perhaps, that was going to be this place where an aristocracy of race would long, long endure. And Lincoln understood this. He understood what they wanted, and he was determined to fight it.